Hi there, and welcome back. Um, so, in the previous parts of this video, uh, we were, we have been trying to solve uh, the the the, the nonlinear second order nonlinear differential equation, the Duffing equation, uh, using a multi-scale expansion method. Um, so, just as a reminder, uh, the the Duffing equation is a uh, uh, it's, it's an equation of this form, d2 y d d2 plus y plus epsilon y cube is zero, where epsilon is a small parameter, um, uh, which we take to be a positive parameter, and y and d, uh, y is a dependent variable, and d is the independent variable, which we take to be as a time variable, and it's suitably non-dimensionalized. And we're solving this subject to the initial conditions, that y at t equals zero is one, and dy dt at t equals zero, we are using the dot notation, uh, dy dt at t equals zero is zero. And so the idea behind using a multi-scale expansion method is to introduce a new time scale into the problem, uh, tau, which is epsilon times t, um, and then look for an expansion of y uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of functions of the form y naught and y one, uh, which are both uh, functions of the time t and the the time tau that we've introduced um, into the problem. And in the process we find that uh, we have a second order homogeneous. Uh, linear differential equation for y naught in terms of a partial derivative of y naught with respect to the time t, um, which we uh, which we uh, and, and the solution for this we express in terms of an as yet undetermined uh, function a, which is a function of tau, um, and then uh, we have another uh, second order uh, linear differential equation for y one, but this is a forced uh, differential equation, and. Uh, and what we find is that uh, in order to ensure, um, uh, now if you recall uh, when we were trying to solve this uh, Duffing equation using uh, regular perturbation methods, um, it was a solution for y1 that had a secular term. And now what we want to do is we want to ensure that um, there are no secular terms in the solution for y1. And the way to do, to do that is to ensure that the forcing which is coming from the terms on the right hand side of this uh, differential equation, uh, the forcing doesn't contain any uh, terms which will force the system at its uh, natural frequency. Now the natural frequency for this uh, system is omega equals one, uh, because the solution for this is essentially of the form, uh, uh, this, the, the solution for this would essentially be of the form some function e tau e to the power of i t plus its conjugate e star tau e to the power of minus i t. And I'm writing b because we're writing solution for y1. Uh, the, the, the solution for the homogeneous differential equation for y1 would have this kind of a solution and this uh, is a is a, and the frequency the natural frequency at which this oscillates is omega equals one so as long as we can ensure that uh, the right hand side which is the forcing doesn't contain any forcing at omega equals one uh, we will ensure that the solution for y1 con does not contain any secular terms and, and that essentially involves ensuring that the terms in these square brackets are zero so that gives us a differential equation for the function a, which is essentially of this form. Um, and once we figure this out, we, we can be assured that the solution for y1 is bounded. Um, and, and, and in the process, we would also know what a is. And that will give us the solution for y0. So, so let's work out this differential equation now, or the solution to this differential equation. So the differential equation essentially is um, 2i d a d tau equals uh, minus 3a squared a star. Um, now, one of the ways for solving this differential equation is to use the polar representation for a and write it in the form of r tau e to the power of pi theta tau, and then uh, substitute it into, this, into the equation. Mm -hmm. um, so, we need to find out what the first derivative of a with respect to tau is. Um, so, da d tau is dr d tau, we differentiate using the chain rule, uh, or the product rule, dr d tau e to the power i theta tau plus i r tau um, e to the power i theta tau and d theta d tau. Um, so, so that's the first derivative and then um, and then we just substitute it into this equation uh, to find that um, we have a term 2i times dr d tau e to the power of i theta, then minus 2 r uh, e to the power of i theta, d theta d tau equals minus 3. Uh, now a square will be uh, r square e to the power of 2 i theta, and then a, a star will be uh, r e to the power of minus i theta. And we can combine these together to write in form uh, minus 3 
r cube e to the power i theta. So we have a factor which is common, which is e to the power i theta, and we can get rid of this. Uh, and now we can uh, separate the real and imaginary parts of this resultant equation that we have. So we have, uh, so the resultant equation we have is 2i dr d tau minus 2r d theta d tau is minus 3r cube. Uh, so if we are comparing two complex functions, uh, let's say on the left hand side or the right hand side, uh, then we know that the real part should be equal and the imaginary part should be equal. So if we compare the real, uh, if we compare the imaginary parts, we find that dr d tau should be equal to zero because there is no imaginary part on the right hand side. So this gives us one of the equations, dr d tau is zero. And then we have a second equation coming from comparing the real parts, uh, which will give us d theta d tau equals um, 3 over 2 um, r squared. So, uh, so we now have two sort of uh, differential equations um, that we can solve for r and theta. So since dr d tau is 0, this tells us that r as a function of tau is just a constant. And, and once we know that, uh, then, we, then we can integrate this part, 3 over 2. So this will be of the form 3 over 2 c1 squared. And if we integrate this, we find that uh, theta is 3 over 2 c1 squared tau plus another constant c2. Okay, so, so this gives us the complete functional form for r uh, for a tau. So a tau is of the form r, which is a constant, times e to the power i theta, which is of the form um, 3 over 2 c1 squared tau plus c2, where c1 and c2 are some constants. Okay, so with this we have uh, a way for, uh, so, so first of all we have now ensured that uh, having solved for a tau, uh, we, we, now, uh, we have now ensured that y1, uh, whatever y1 is, uh, it will remain bounded, although we are not explicitly solving for y1, um, and in fact we cannot solve it using just uh, uh, an expansion up to order epsilon squared. Uh, because the solution for y1 would again involve some function of the form, let's say, b tau. And in order to figure out b tau, uh, we need to expand to another order, uh, which is y2, and then s ensure that there are no secular terms there, and so on and so forth. Um, but for now, we are assured that, uh, they, uh, that the solution will remain bounded. So now let's figure out what y0 is, what's the, what's the complete form for y0. So if you recall, uh, y0 as a function of t and tau, was a tau e to the power i t plus a star e to the power minus i t. And if we substitute in what we just worked out, then our a, a tau is c1 e to the power i. Uh, then we have term 3 over 2 c1 square tau plus c2 plus t coming from the first term. And then we have c2 e to the power of the conjugate of this, which is minus i. 3 over 2 c1 square tau plus c2 plus t. Um, sorry, this, this is again the same constant c1 here. Okay. Uh, and now, we say that this is of the form c1 e to the power of some function, let's say phi, plus c1 e to the power minus some function phi. And so we can combine these two and write y0 in the form of a cosine, and it will be 2 c1 cosine of um, 3 over 2 c1 square tau plus c2 plus t. So that's the complete solution for y0. Uh, so we still need to figure out these constants c1 and c2 and now we can make use of this, these initial conditions to figure out these constants. Um, so uh, the expansion that we have assumed for y is of the form y0 t comma tau plus epsilon y1 t comma tau up to order epsilon squared. Um, now when t is 0, then we know that tau is also 0. And so, uh, so if, you, if you substitute this initial condition, then y at 0 comma 0 is y0 at 0 comma 0 plus epsilon y1 at 0 comma 0, which we know is 1. And therefore, we know that y0 at 0 comma 0 is 1 y1 at 0, 0 is 0. If we compare, again, uh, when we compare a perturbation series with, um, uh, with let's say, another perturbation series on, on the right hand side, we'll assume that we can compare terms of like orders in epsilon. 
uh, which is which is uh, an, an assumption that we that we always uh, end up making. Um, so we find that y naught at zero comma zero should be one, and y one at zero comma zero should be zero. And then we have uh, the other initial condition, which is the first derivative of y naught, uh, y with respect to time t is zero. So um, so so we we need to differentiate this with respect to t. So dy dt is if you recall on the form dy naught dt plus um, plus epsilon dy naught d uh, tau plus we have an epsilon um, and then we differentiate this dy1 dt plus epsilon uh, dy1 d tau. Um, so let me just write on this these initial conditions here. So we have y naught at zero comma zero is zero. Um, and from here, uh, we know that dy dt at t equals zero is zero. So this is zero. Uh, and then again, if we compare like terms, then we find that dy naught dt plus um, epsilon to order epsilon, we have dy naught d tau plus dy uh, one dt. So at t equals zero, we find that uh, the partial derivative of y naught with respect to time t at zero comma zero is sorry this is this one one is zero. Uh, so that's one of the conditions, and the other condition is that these two are equal. So d y naught d tau should be equal to minus d y one d t. So let's see what happens with these two conditions. Um, so we know that y naught at zero comma zero is one, and that should be equal to two c one. Uh, so if you substitute zero comma zero, then we find this is cosine of um, c two. So that, that we know should be 1. Um, and then we need to differentiate this with respect to time t, uh, partial derivative dy naught dt is um, minus 2 c1 sine of, uh, and this evaluated at 0 comma 0 would be c2 is 0. Um, so this tells us that um, um, c2 should be 0. So if we choose c to, so if we choose c1 equal to zero, then both these would be zero. So that's not possible. Uh, whereas if we choose c2 equal to zero, then sine of c2 is zero. Um, and and then uh, from here we can go back and substitute this here to find that cosine of zero is one, and thus will give us c1 equals half. So c2 is zero and c1 is half. And so the complete solution that we have for y naught is uh, y naught. Uh, T from top is C1 is half, so it's just cosine 3 over 2 uh, C1 square is half, so it's tau uh, divided by 4 plus C2 is 0 times T. Um, but we also know that tau is epsilon times T, and so the solution is essentially uh, T times, um, so this is epsilon times T, uh, so this is 1 plus 3 over 8. Okay, so this is our uh, leading order multi-scale solution to the Duffing equation, subject to the initial conditions y0 is 0, y0 is 1, and y dot 0 is 0. And as you can see from here, this solution is bounded for all times t because this is just a cosine of a time function, 1 plus 3 over 8 epsilon. Um, and in the process of solving this equation, we also saw that we had to ensure that y1, the solution for y1, does not contain any secular terms, um, which is what gave us the function a of tau. Um, so we are assured with this that uh, the, fir the, the first order solution would also remain bounded. Um, what we haven't shown is whether other higher order terms will also remain bounded. In and in order to do that, uh, we would actually have to introduce more time scales into the problem and also solve for y2 and y1 and so on and so forth. Um, but but it turns out that this is a very very good approximation to the to the uh, solution for the nonlinear Duffing equation. Um, so uh, so yeah, I hope this was of some use uh, and uh, was uh, an introduction to the multi-scale expansion method. Um, and um, yeah, hope to see you um, sometime soon. Thanks.